When we listen to a sound, what's actually happening is that our ears are responding to tiny pressure variations in the air. We are living at the bottom of a sea of air, so these pressure fluctuations are very, very small in comparison with the mean atmospheric pressure at the bottom of this sea of air. Now our ears can respond to frequencies in the range of about 20 cycles per second up to 20,000 cycles per second. I'm in the reverberation chamber at the University of Edinburgh. The walls here and the ceiling are all hard plaster, so they're very good reflectors of sound. Notice also that the ceiling is sloping, and none of the walls are parallel. What you're hearing is the direct sound coming from my mouth together with the reflections from the floor, the ceiling and the walls. This is the reverberant sound. There are so many multiple reflections in this reverberant sound field that it takes quite a few seconds for the sound to die completely. I've moved now into the anechoic chamber. Here the ceiling, the walls and even the floor are lined with sound absorbing foam wedges. Anechoic really means non-echoing. So what you're hearing is just the direct sound from my mouth. And the absence of reflections from the walls means that the sound is much clearer than in the reverberation chamber, but the overall sound level is less. When recording sounds, a stereo microphone is often used. This is a typical stereo microphone, and you see it's got two microphone heads, both pointing in different directions. Now, if the sound is coming from the right-hand side, then one of the heads, this one, will give a higher volume output than the other head. So when the sounds are replayed through a two-speaker stereo system, then the directional characteristics, characteristics of the sound are reproduced, and you're able to tell if the sound's coming from the right or the left. To get better defined directional characteristics to the sound, you can use a multi-speaker system. A well-known one is the 5.1 configuration, where you have five separate speakers laid out in different positions together with a single bass loudspeaker. Now even more realistic directional characteristics can be obtained if you use binaural recording. Here I've got two binaural microphones which are designed to fit into the ear so you can put them in the ear while you're doing your recording. Alternatively, you can actually put them onto a dummy head and then place this at a position where you want the sound to be recorded. So I've got the head here, you can put the earphones into the head and just like this and then position the head at exactly the position you want. When the sound from the two channels is replayed through headphones, then you get an uncannily realistic realisation of the three-dimensional sound field around you. Here are some common situations in the environment where the noise produced can be quite obtrusive.
frequency content of a sound shows up in the spectrogram. Higher frequencies are near to the top of the spectrogram. The white trace right at the top is a raw signal from the microphone. When monitoring the loudness of sounds, for example for environmental evaluation, a decibel meter is often used. This is a typical decibel meter. It's calibrated so that zero decibels corresponds to the lower limit of hearing and 120 decibels corresponds to the threshold of pain. Now I've set this one to A weighting which means that the frequency response of the meter corresponds approximately to the frequency response of the human ear. Wind turbines produce a swishing noise as the blades rotate, known as aerodynamic modulation or AM noise. AM noise shows up as successive peaks in the spectrogram. Research is going on around the world in universities and research institutions to minimise noise levels in the environment. Not all noises are undesirable. The centre of Edinburgh during festival time would be sadly lacking in atmosphere if there was no noise in the streets.